In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown defined authenticity as a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and to be real, the choice to be honest, and the choice to let our true selves be seen. My guest today believes in this authenticity and has the courage to let his true self shine. Colonel Nand Kumar is an alumni of National Defence Academy and Indian Military Academy. He served the Indian Army for 21 years and was posted throughout the country in different roles. He has participated in counter-insurgency operations codenamed Operation Rhino in the Northeast, where his unit was tasked to bring about peace in Kokrajhar, Assam. He was part of the Operation Rakshak in Jammu and Kashmir Valley. He also has an experience of serving in the highest battlefield in the world, the Siachen Glacier. Colonel Nandakumar has a distinction of being selected as an instructor in Officers Training Academy, Chennai, and has trained more than 300 cadets to be officers in the army. He's also selected to represent the Indian Army in the United Nations Peacekeeping Force at Eritrea and Ethiopia in Africa. He commanded his own unit, the 18th Medium Regiment at Gurez in Jammu and Kashmir on the line of control, which is one of the most inhospitable terrains of the country. During this tenure, his unit has been awarded the General Officer Commanding Appreciation Flag. Colonel Nandakumar took premature retirement from the Indian Army and joined the corporate world in January 2018. He's presently working with a financial firm heading the incident management team in Pune. He is an outdoor sea person, being undertaken numerous adventure activities such as paragliding, para-jumping, etc. and has also participated in many marathons. I'm delighted to introduce my guest today, Colonel V. Nandakumar. Thank you, Colonel, for giving me your time and welcome to my channel. Uh, thank you, Aparna. Thank you for that very flattering introduction. You have such an impressive bio, 21 years, multiple missions, and I'm sure you have uh, truckloads of lessons that you can share with us. But I want to start today by asking you to summarize your entire journey in a nutshell. Would you be able to do that? Well, I can have just one word for it, and that is exhilarating. But I think you are not looking for just one word. Uh, so what can I say? I, I, I have uh, had the good fortune of uh, serving in an army where uh, I could undertake a lot of uh, activities which uh, I can't buy outside. Mm. So in that way, uh, I am very happy and content of the experiences that I got and the places I could see and the situations I could deal with. Uh, but yes, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating world there. Awesome. Awesome. So has there been any particular incident or an event that has impacted your life in a big way? And what have you learned from that? Army uh, life was full of, uh, I would say, incidents and learnings. You know, when I joined the NDA, mm. uh, just to take you back in time, uh, I'm not from a Fauji background. Okay. And, uh, so I had very limited knowledge of uh, the armed forces. And uh, when I finished my 12th in 91, my aim was to do an MBA. Mm. So I had I had just moved to a commerce, uh, I'd uh, rolled up, uh, enrolled in the commerce class and had plans to do MBA because that was the hot thing then. Mm. Uh, I was not, I would say, I, I can't say I was patriotic or non-patriotic, but yeah, country was certainly not in the, you know, the, the headlines of my agenda. It was just to have a good time. I was in college. Uh, mm. It's then that a friend who had joined NDA wrote a letter to me telling about the activities. Uh, telling about the games he gets to play, getting, telling about the three-course meals he has, telling about the horse riding that he does, the swimming. And I am like, my goodness, this is the works. This is the life I want. And I enrolled and I got in within a couple of months. Awesome. That is when I realized that my good friend had only told me the good things. He didn't tell me the, the, the hardships. He didn't tell me that one had to wake up at four in the morning. Mm. and could not sleep before maybe 11 or 12. And there were five batch of seniors ready to train you apart from the official trainers. So I was in a rude shock. And uh, the second week, I decided that this was not my cup of tea. And I put up my papers to get back. 
uh, oh. NDA wanted uh, your guardian or your parent to you know come and take you. That mm. was the rule. So I spoke to my father. There were no mobiles those days. Uh, it was a phone call which we were permitted once a week. So he heard me out. He said, "Okay, uh, I, I have some urgent work. Let me finish that, and I'll come and get you." The next week, the same thing happened, and I was very angry with my dad. But by the third week, I found something changing. Mm. What I found so difficult in the first week did not seem so difficult in the third week, and I didn't give him a call. I said, "Let me try. I can do it." And in fact, that is my very first lesson in the army that, you know, we just need to hang in there, and uh, we need not give up the very first time we find something difficult. But that was just my uh, beginning, getting the introduction to the I would say the army way of life. But the whole twenty-one years I've spent in the army and even in corporate life is full of lessons for us, and mm. uh, I, I continue to be a learner. So while this was happening, and in those twenty-one years. what kind of mindsets uh, you or attitudes do you think did you have to develop so that you sustain and not just sustain actually you thrive i think you thrived in army it's the army way of life it's the army training which uh, molds the person mm. so i would rather uh, not take the credit on myself but i would credit the army because they introduced us in a very baby steps and uh, it was not uh, it was a, a concept of carrying everyone with them mm-hmm. it was not a concept of selecting the fittest so if there were 340 odd of us who joined the nda that batch mate apart from the few who left initially because maybe they mm-hmm. didn't like the way of life rest all of us continued and finished the three year tough training if if now i recount and i say can i do it all over again well that's a big question mark but then uh, i think it's it's how uh, we bonded and uh, the very spirit uh, which was driven from the day one in the nda was that mm. though it though it is uh, in a disciplinary way but uh, i i questioned it then but right now i understand the gravity was that when any of our uh, batchmates since we were the junior most did any mistake the mm. whole batch had to pay the price and we were like what 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 nonsense is this every day we are you know getting punished because there were 20 of us and someone not or, or the other would goof up mm. but then that built the camaraderie so when we were in a camp and maybe i could not uh, run uh, and finish the run my rifle was picked up by someone else my packs was taken by somebody else they didn't question that uh, you know this guy has to complete on his own so uh, le- let me go faster or something so uh, that is the way of uh, uh, i would mm. say life uh, in the entire army whether it's training or in the unit we uh, mold as a group and we move on so uh, i would say that's the uh, the greatest uh, i would say support system which is there within the organization it's one for all and all for one it's right. it's a team spirit so uh, recently there were a lot of talk about uh, you know each unit has its war cry mm. that while uh, bharat mata ki jai is a common thing or jai hind is a more uh, you know it's a kind of salutation you stick cross but if you go each unit have their own like my own was shivaji maharaj ki jai hmm that is because my unit had pure marathas as soldiers right so uh, it has to more to do with uh, what the group identifies itself a- and that's how the army is done there were a lot of talk about uh, why are uh, we still continuing with the british system where they had a uh, few castes like coming the rajputs in one mm. regiment the you know the south indians in one uh, like madras regiment but i think it helps to build the bond and uh, ach- come on to a common goal or an objective right and you mentioned that you had to identify with someone like in for example in your regiment it is shivaji maharaj ki jai so uh, how is that helping the team or the group uh, yes aparna you are right that it, it is a very important and critical element Uh, in fact uh, while in the indian army the units are organized uh, we have both the sets we have mixed units also and we have uh, ethnic uh, while the jawans are there the officers are posted from anywhere and from mm. so just to give you an example uh, in my unit we had a mandir parade we call that also a parade mandir parade every morning at 9 o'clock so uh, in my initial days i was very surprised to see one of my seniors major john michael doing the aarti during one of such mandir parades he was a devout christian who used to go to church every sunday 
Mm. On that particular Sunday, he had left the church and come to the unit because he was the senior most officer and he had to do the arati. So uh, I think in the Indian army, while we are religious at the face of it, we have war cries, we identify with uh, whatever, uh, you know, the culture from our, where our troops come. But at the same time, uh, it is, uh, I would say, identifying with the troops rather than the personality. So when I say Shivaji Maharaj Ki Jai, Shivaji Maharaj was a great personality. We have a lot of military learnings from him. But if I take a different view, I am identifying with my troops who are Marathas. Mm. Again, looking back at your uh, uh, journey in the 21 years, what moments do you think are your most cherishing ones? That's a difficult one because, uh, like I said, uh, uh, the life has been full of learning, surprises and happy moments. But if I would uh, have to pick one moment as a cherishing one, you know, uh, some of the people who can't adjust uh, with the army, Jawans, they go on leave and they don't come back sometimes. They are, they are usually called deserters. Oh. And yeah, and, and the police go and apprehend them if, uh, and then get them back and they are tried and all that. So when I was commanding my unit, I came to know of a person who had gone away from the regiment three years back, almost three years. There was just, it was just one uh, month short mm. and he wanted to join back. The police could not trace him, but he wanted to join back on his own. So I was quite uh, intrigued by it that uh, beyond three years, the police stopped looking for him. So no one would be troubling him. Mm. So I was quite intrigued that a person who has evaded the police for almost three years, just one month shy, why is he coming back? Then I did my uh, kind of research. And since I told you my troops were from Maharashtra, I had somebody staying in the nearby village who went and so and on. Uh, but what I was driving was it that the usual process was for such a long period of absence, the soldier had to be court-martialed, maybe sent to jail, or maybe dismissed for service. Mm. It had to be something very strict because that sets an example. Because almost three years of absence is not a joke. But when I went into the details, and it took a lot of time and effort, uh, I found that, yes, there was the genuine reason why he had left the army. Mm. some circumstances which uh, I would say was not very conducive for him and uh, his present condition in the village and all that made me take a view that yes he needs a second chance mm. while I was well within my rights to do that but the process was very uh, I would say very detailed uh, and very difficult because I had to uh, go and convince my seniors that I'm, it is not just I'm trying for some cheap popularity Mm. But yes, uh, I have done my homework and yes, this person can be given a second chance because of A, B, C. Well, it was, I, it took me almost six months, but, uh, uh, but I'm happy that I did it. And uh, today, if I look back, uh, I think I could really touch that life, one life, uh, apart from all the nice uh, adventurous moment that I had. But I think uh, uh, that uh, not just uh, touched him, but it also touched my entire unit that, okay, my commanding officer is ready to go the length to help someone. So uh, that I take as my biggest takeaway from my 21 years of the army. Wow. In army, uh, you always look up to your leaders. You know, they're always somebody who you want to become. They, they become like your idols. And to challenge them, uh, how, did, how did that make you feel? Yes, sir. you're right in the... Uh, form that uh, in the army you need uh, people to follow your orders and challenging is very difficult but mm -hmm. the army offers you the other side also the army offers you free speech okay and and uh, at any rank or uh, i would say at any position you are given that opportunity of putting across your point mm -hmm. but after you put across your point then you follow the senior that's it so there is no there's no revolting or there is no disobedience but yes, you are given a chance to put across your point. So in that way, I was lucky that the general whom I represented, while he took his time to understand, I, and, I, and there was a lot of speed work I had to do to prove it to him, mm. uh, I was never asked to shut up and follow orders. I, I was always given a chance. And uh, that uh, maybe uh, helps uh, the organization in putting across the point. Right. Amazing. You, you have been to several missions, right? There was Operation Rhino and then Operation Rakshak. But has there been any such mission which has challenged you, um, you know, which brought out the vulnerability, if, if I can say that? Yeah, uh, if I could say what was the most challenging uh, 
period of my life or my army service i would say uh, it was in the northeast when we were uh, involved in the counter insurgency uh, why mm-hmm. i say that is because in a in a counter insurgency environment you are dealing with your own citizens mm-hmm. and you can't differentiate a, between who is a ordinary citizen or who would be a insurgent or a terrorist mm-hmm. uh, like the what i used to say is that respect all and suspect all like mm. that's something which we had to do it so when i was in kokrajhar there was uh, we were uh, earlier in nalbari uh, that was another part of assam and suddenly we were pulled into kokrajhar because the ethnic uh, violence broke out between the bodos and the adivasis mm. and there was a rampage uh, i i would say i have seen some of the most uh, inhuman sights uh, which i could uh, which anyone could possibly see and we were given a very immediate responsibility of quelling the incidents on a immediate basis because the the intensity was such that even mm. one more day of something going wrong could not be absorbed i was a young uh, captain that time and in my uh, area of kokrajhar we had to patrol at the same time it was useless because the minute i would cross a street maybe somebody would go and you know do something right so intelligence was the key there and the intelligence we could not wait for the uh, the intelligence agencies like raw or ib to give us feed the intelligence had to come from the community themselves so that we could act timely mm. and that i felt was a great challenge because it was not the the numerical superiority or the weapon system it was to be at the right time at the right place to make sure nothing wrong happens uh, so that i found quite challenging because i was ne- we were never trained to be uh, intelligence officers we were never trained uh, in citizenship programs where we would go and uh, you know uh, kind of have some good uh, relations built into the community but that was a learning on the go uh, mm. and uh, we developed very good uh, connections with the local community which helped us to uh, stabilize the situation so that tenure i do take as a lot of uh, uh, very learning tenure for me wow one of the biggest hot spots for us uh, you know has always been jammu and kashmir and uh, you have been in the most inhospitable areas while i am sure there would be fantastic stories over there i'm more interested in the kind of emotions uh, fears if i can say at that moment when you are posted in uh, such inhospitable conditions uh yeah parna you're true that uh, yes kashmir is a hot spot and uh, there's a lot of army deployed there and there are a lot of incidents uh, and army may not be the uh, most welcomed uh, uh, you know organization there for obvious reasons mm-hmm. uh, but having said that uh, uh, i feel that whenever we inter- interact with one person you know from whichever community it may be mm-hmm. once we know the person then the religion or their uh, opinion or anything does not matter because you have a connect the mm-hmm. whole problem comes in when we deal with faceless people when we say when we talk about them as a community or when we talk of them as from a certain region mm. then you don't have a personal bonding so uh, when i was posted in uh, gurez uh, that was uh, one of the inhospitable terrains and that being right at the loc that was the uh, one of the favorite routes for the infiltrators to come in mm. and yes we also know that the infiltrators don't come in without the local help correct right so uh, we were dealing with uh, those kind of mixed emotions but like i said in the previous incident also that if you have your guard up you need not be ruthless you need not be arrogant you mm. can still have a very friendly person with your guard up in the night if you have gone and put up an ambush then i will not really ask my troops to see what is happening if they find somebody with a weapon they are mm. going to fire at them mm. that, that that's plain and simple but that does not mean that i point my weapon at a civilian in the daylight when i see that he is harmless so right. uh, i think uh, that uh, kind of uh, narrative helped us uh, in fact uh, i can i can recount of a incident when my wife had come and joined me for just two months because uh, it's only the summers that gurez people can come and usually families are encouraged to just come mm. so she's a restless woman so she uh, wanted to do something for the locals so she went ahead and did some computer classes and other thing teaching them my initial apprehension the first thing was that uh, i sent a you know few of our soldiers who would stand there with weapons and all and she mm. said nothing doing 
the next day she said i don't want any of these people because uh, then the locals are just not coming up mm. so that was a quite a dilemma for me but i went with her call after speaking to few of the locals there and uh, she was there for a month and every morning she used to go there and do uh, conduct those classes for the locals and get back and never did she face any kind of a problem or anyone trying to take advantage mm. of the situation so i think it's more about how you uh, connect with the locals which can give you uh, i would say heads up over what's really happening right so um, are have there been any uh, situations where which made you say vulnerable and if yes how did you deal with them uh, i was uh, vulnerable whenever we were uh, a, any situation posted uh, kind of presented to me it may not be necessarily a military one it could be uh, a very uh, simple thing where i could not do what i wanted to do for my team okay uh, it could be anything of that kind uh, one thing which i i uh, remember off hand since we are speaking of gurez only uh, like just to give you a background gurez is closed for 7 months of the year the the, okay. the road is closed it's heavily snow so nobody is oh. allowed to go it's helicopters are the only way that people go in and go out and to uh, economize or optimize the heptar effort it's only the uh, you know either few people who are not well or some critical cases so in my unit uh, i had one cook who had who was from kerala incidentally and who had his marriage planned he had informed us we had uh, uh, put his uh, name on the roster for the uh, heli everything done the staff work was done Mm. but unfortunately the weather backed up mm. and the flight reduced to a trickle and when that happened one not flight used to come but then there were more critical cases to be sent that is one time that i really felt vulnerable because this person was uh, really uh, at a was an emotional wreckage because uh, his family back in kerala again not much of visibility of how forge works they thought mm. he's avoiding the marriage and there was a, a big uh, tension between both the families about what was going to happen mm. and uh, at that time as his commanding officer i felt very vulnerable that uh, despite my best attempts i could not send him home so uh, so we did uh, what was uh, best possible because the families decided to go ahead with the marriage you know you would have heard all those stories of having the photograph and uh, yeah yeah marriage. so that really happened oh. and luckily for me like i said i encouraged people to speak luckily for me one of the other staff told him sir tomorrow is this guy's marriage in town uh, and we are not even able to see it i believe there is some uh, tv crew also coming so i quickly found out and i uh, one of the uh, i think it was asia net or something which was covering the event because that also was you know it was right. uh, breaking news for them something yeah. like that happening uh, so we quickly got together and uh, we made sure that the channel is there and we had a small ceremony for him at our end very nice a very basic <laughs> at the spur of the moment but yes the tv was on uh, he was able to see his folks uh, we got him a mobile connection and we made a simple ceremony a little religious ceremony so that he feels the connect with that so uh, that was a very interesting thing but yes at that time i really felt vulnerable that i could not uh, help him out in that situation is that the first virtual marriage then because uh, <laughs> i now nowadays we are we are hearing about or rather i've heard about virtual marriages oh. uh, during the lockdown but is that could be one of the first virtual marriages that had happened yeah awesome all right so uh, any unforgettable moments uh, that you had in your 21 years in defense which made you incredible pr- incredibly proud of yourself uh, you're speaking to a leo <laughs> we are we i am i'm always uh, on the thing <laughs> uh but uh, yes i think um, the un mission uh, uh, was one such moment not for myself but for the indian army as such because that was the first time i i was having an exposure to the armies of rest of the world mm. so while uh, each army thrives uh, on uh, you know self belief and believing that they are the best which is a very essential element if a person has to uh, be in the army and fight for his nation but uh, there there was an open comparison Mm. you know we were with they were pakistani bangladeshis from france uk african countries and there not just me but all the indian officers 
wherever we were posted and staff gave a very good account of ourselves in fact uh, how it came to the forefront was that in one of the briefings where we had a jordanian force commander uh, and he was getting every monthly update from each of the branch at the end of the thing he said is this a un mission or is this an indian army mission because each and every guy briefing him was an indian army officer despite wow. being others so he made this mention and that is the time it hit me and i i i felt incredibly incredibly proud of my army and of myself obviously uh, of the training that they have given and of the skill set that they have enabled us so that yes that certainly was a very proud moment for me in the next part we learn about some key missions failures unlearning and relearning and transition into the civil world keep watching